Where better to build the capital of the state of Victoria than right here, with its beautiful bay and its fantastic views and its tree-lined shores? The Waterung people called it Geelong, the place of the seabird over the white cliffs. Lovely. Of course, it isn't the capital of Victoria, but it might well have been if it hadn't been for a quirk of nature over there. Come on, I'll tell you all about it. This week, I'm heading south to lovely seaside Geelong. So I'm starting and finishing by the water. I'm going to see a racing man about a legendary horse. This is where they hit it. Yeah. A gentleman bush ranger about an uncooperative mount. Excuse me, I hope you don't mind me doing this. And a cafe crowd about a misleading map. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Sooner or later, I'll end up in jail. Back in the 1840s, there were two big towns in Victoria, Geelong, and Melbourne, and they were both very successful, so either of them could have become the capital, but Geelong had a real problem. Do you see over there, there's a promontory, and off it, there was a huge sandbar, which made it virtually inaccessible to big ships. Now, if the government of the day had been prepared to cut through it, then maybe Geelong would have ended up as the capital, but they didn't, and it lost. It may not have been given the captain's armband, but Victoria's second largest city was, and still is, an important player in the state's economy. That's the Yarra Street Pier, and this is what it would have looked like round here in the late 19th century. Lots of noise, lots of commerce, lots of ships. In fact, at that time, Geelong was the pivot of trade between the goldfields and Melbourne, and people around here were really proud of that fact. But by the 1980s, the pier had been burnt down, and now there isn't a hint of it left in the landscape. Well, maybe there is just one hint. Look at these, they're great, aren't they? They were actually made from salvaged timber from the pier. Got a sailor here, just ashore by the look of his duffel bag. Chatting up a rather dodgy looking young lady with cute little pink knees. Wonder how she got those. Some more over there. Hey, there's some lifeguards here. Who's carrying a rather extraordinary looking duck there? Another one? This one's got a black eye. Excuse me, did right. you make these? I did make them. I, I helped Jan Mitchell, the uh, local artist in Geelong, make them. The late Jan Mitchell was a primary school artist in residence when she came up with the idea of the bollards in 1994. Was she a bit of a character, she looks like? She, she was a character, and she always put a lot of quirky things into the, to the groups of bollards that we did. There were, there's always a, another story behind them. And Look, there's... <laughs> What I can see here is a rather cute little grey bum and a, a little fluffy tail. What's that all about? Well, well, that's a rabbit, and the rabbits were introduced in Winchelsea nearby to Geelong. Well, there was only 24 or so of them, wasn't there? That's and they, right. they turned into millions. That's right. Now yeah. we've got rabbits everywhere. Um, and, and the rabbits will be on any of the bollards that the history is after 1859. Which is when the rabbits were introduced. That's right. So yes. how many more of these bollards are there? There's 106 around the foreshore. And, and we're in the middle right now. Oh, great. Well, I'll go and see if I can find some more. Yeah. And some more rabbits. Have a look for the rabbits. Thanks a lot. See, there's another rabbit down here. It's great, isn't it? It's a fantastic way to tell Geelong's history. Better than me. And look at that. In memory of our friend Gary Duchy Redvelt, 
and his crewmates who gave their lives fighting the Linton bushfire, 2nd of December, 1998. That's nice, isn't it? It's such a glorious sunny day, I'd love to stop here at Eastern Beach Baths, which were built in the 1930s and then lovingly restored in the 1990s. But this is a walk, not a swim. Besides, there's something I want to show you up the hill. If you want a really glorious piece of Geelong architecture, take a look at this. Careful crossing the road. Carayo Villa. Isn't it fantastic? See the great big tower behind the tree and then you've got this huge great veranda here with all this lovely tracery on those columns but the odd thing about it is it wasn't built here it's a prefab it was made in edinburgh ordered by some bloke who lived over here but by the time it got here he died it was left on the quayside for six months and then it was bought by someone else and they erected it here apparently without any instructions so I wouldn't be surprised if there was a, a bit left over at the end, would you? Look, there's even a coat of arms at the top there. No wonder they call it the wedding cake house. Huh. I'm heading out of town to sniff out a racing mystery. But first, I need to show you a couple more of Geelong's houses. It's intriguing, compact little mock gothic Victorian house that isn't it? It's been incongruous amongst all these bungalows but it's actually this is a gatehouse and beyond that there would have been not a double garage like there is now but a posh house which is where I'm going right now. This is it, here's the homestead, St Albans homestead built in 1873. It's a beautiful building, isn't it? And it would have been set in colossal grounds. I've just walked, what, something like 400 metres up from the gatehouse, and none of these bungalows would have been here. They would all have been part of the grounds for this house. And you can imagine it being full of local dignitaries and foreign dignitaries and politicians, maybe even royalty and members of the racing fraternity, because in the late 19th century, this was one of the most important studs in Australia. But one famous racehorse to grace St Albans wasn't bred here. His short stay was one of Australian racing's best kept secrets. Michael. Oh, Tony, how are you? All right, mate. Listen, in 1930, uh, you had a rather special guest here, didn't you? Yes, yes. We had uh, Farlap, the winner of the 1930 Melbourne Cup, come here. Who was the most celebrated racehorse of his generation? Absolutely. He was uh, a, a freak, a, an absolute freak. Farlap, big red to his fans, was a hero to most Australians during the Depression. I say most because a few days before the 1930 Melbourne Cup, Someone tried to kill the red hot favourite as he was being walked along a suburban street. A car pulled up alongside Farlap, and, and a couple of villains were in the back seat and produced a shotgun and had a crack at the horse. They missed. So, incompetent villains. Very incompetent. But scary villains. nevertheless. <laughs> and then he was going to go on to take part in the Melbourne Cup. Which was on the Tuesday. Well, that jockey must have been nervous. Well, the jockey wasn't there at the time, ah. but they did ring him up later on and tell him that what they were going to get him next. This is the, the jockey for the next race? Yeah, the, that's the Jim Pike. Cup. And uh, he said, well, that's pretty good, mate. You, you can't even hit a bloody horse, so how are you going to hit a little bloke like me? <laughs> Let's go and have a look. Still, Farlap's owners were taking no chances. The champ was whisked away to St Albans in the dead of night. This is where they hid him? In here, yeah. Let's have a look at that. It's a bit worse for wear at the moment, but that's where he was, in there. And it wasn't much better for his minders. <laughs> they didn't have an en suite, did they? No, it was pretty rough, but it certainly did the job. Farlap was in there, the guys were camped in here, and they were on guard, protecting him, and everything was snug as a bug in a rug, so to speak. There were still problems, though? They got ready to come to Melbourne. Some extra coppers arrived with motorbikes and what have you and a full escort, the whole deal, loaded him up, and the truck wouldn't start. <sighs> and they cranked and cranked and cranked this rotten thing. It wouldn't start. 
An hour later, it leapt into life and they got to Melbourne in the nick of time. They had to put the race timing uh, back a bit yeah. to, to allow them enough time to get into the race course. And it all worked out well in the end? It did. He went and won the Melbourne Cup. Yay. Very much so. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I like stories with a happy ending. Well, I do too. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. There's another great Melbourne Cup story that belongs to a lad called Peter St Albans, who was born here in about 1865. A decade or so later, it was the Melbourne Cup, and the jockey riding a horse called Brasias couldn't make the weight. So the owner said to little Peter, would you ride Brasias? And the little boy said, yeah, fine. And he told the authorities he was 13. He was actually only 11. He got on the horse, he rode the Melbourne Cup, the most celebrated horse race in the whole of Australia, and he won comfortably. But the charming part of the story is that apparently he went into school the next day and his teacher said, Peter, why weren't you here yesterday? And he said, oh, I was uh, riding the Melbourne Cup and I won. Although whether the teacher actually believed him or not, history doesn't record. I'm discovering what makes Geelong tick. I've talked to a load of old bollards at the waterfront, found a fabulous prefab mansion, and mucked about in the one-star hideout of a four-legged legend. And now it's time to do some time. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. During World War II, Geelong Jail was a military prison. And one day, some of its inmates decided to become outmates. Excuse me, are, are you the tour guide? That's me. Uh, would you mind if I hijack your group for a second? This, this is about the Great Escape. You know about the Great Escape from here? I know a little bit about it. Uh, the year was? 1945. Absolutely correct. 1945, 21st of July, 22 prisoners break out of here into the yard. Would you do that for me? Oh, Off you go. Break out, break out. That's, that's, uh, through that door there, that's it. This presumably is uh, where the prison guard would have been. I hope he doesn't mind if I thank you. Borrow his hat. So he saw what was happening and rang through to his superiors. Bring, 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 bring. Nothing happened. Bring, 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 bring. Still nothing happened. Bring, 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 bring. He hadn't realised that the prisoners had actually cut the telephone lines before they escaped. OK, let's go. That's great. Hang on, hang on. Wait, wait one sec. I nearly couldn't catch up with you. <laughs> Obviously, you didn't want to spend the rest of your lives in the exercise yard. You, you had to get over the outside wall. So you started looking around for bean cans and jam cans. This is the wall. So off you go, over to here. And you were looking for ladders as well, scaling ladders to get over the wall. But while that is happening, the guard inside the prison is going, bring, 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 bring. Nothing's happening. Bring, bring, bring. Bring, bring, until eventually another guard hears about the escape because someone outside has seen all the kerfuffle going on. And then, really, the poo hits the fan. Suddenly, there's police, there's guards, there's everyone everywhere. And you've escaped over the wall by this time. We go this way. Hooray! Freedom! Free, free! Standing still cheering outside oh. of the prison. Off you go oh. in all directions. Fan out. That's right. It was, in fact, a, a footy day, and Geelong were at home. So there's a huge crowd around, and they just disappeared into the crowds, and nobody could find them. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, you're the tour guide, weren't you? Right. <laughs> Desperately looking for your I was escaping. tour. What's your name? Brian. Brian. I, I understand that they couldn't be caught there and then. Apart from anything else, they couldn't fire on them, could they? They, wasn't a, they weren't allowed to do that, and they, they disappeared weren't. into the crowd. But why were so few of them caught later on? Well, because the war was coming to an end. Yeah. And they were prisoners of the army, not of the government. Yeah. So once the, or the war ended, therefore, they were. They just got away with the whole thing, and they just dissolved back into the community. And in fact, the the war ended about a month later, didn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. So they they fell into this kind of bureaucratic abyss and avoided both the civilians and, and the army. Absolutely, that's correct. 
Well, so they could still be out there, couldn't they? Well, they could be. Somewhere. They probably are. <laughs> well, it would be lovely if they wrote in, wouldn't it, after this programme? Well, we'd very much like to see them come back, yes. I don't think they will. <laughs> Do you oh, somehow? We won't keep them in here. <laughs> anyway, you better see if you can get your tour back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks very much. Oh, oh thank you. Here's your hat. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've done my time in jail. Let's see what I can dig up on Sydney Avenue. You know the Brownlow Medal, don't you? Even I know the Brownlow Medal for the best and fairest player in the AFL each year. Well, this is the house where Charles Brownlow actually lived. Is it the best house in the street? Is it the fairest? Is it the second best? Is it the third best? Shall we all vote and then put our votes in an armoured vehicle? Do I have a gorgeous wag on my arm? No, I don't. But it is a gorgeous little house, isn't it? That's one of the reasons I love doing walks like this. OK, I'm heading off into town now and... Oh, hang on a bit, there's a minor crisis going on. Whoa! Oh, Sorry, that was our fault. Thank you. Where's your vehicle? Over here, actually. Ah, that is very interesting. Two products, both of which were invented in Geelong. Is that right? Yeah, we, I mean, you know about the ute, don't you? Ford Motor Company of Geelong, a uh, farmer's wife writes to them and says, I need a, a vehicle that will drive me to church on Sunday and keep the pigs in on Monday. Everybody knows about that. But what about this stuff? Any Hello. ideas? Well, it's not, I mean, to be honest, it's not actually ice. It's refrigeration or a kind of refrigeration. There was a bloke called James Harrison who was a journalist who actually started the Geelong Advertiser. And when he used to clean his typeface, he realised that the liquid that he used, which was sulfuric ether, made the typeface cold. And he thought, sulfuric ether, cold, why don't I tip this stuff into a refrigerator? And he did, and it was incredibly successful. And he sold his fridges, not just here in Australia, but in South America and Europe, Britain. So, two great products from one fantastic town. Very interesting. Thank you. You're off for a party tonight. Yeah, party, watching the football. <laughs> Have a good night. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, heading down into the city centre and back to the days of the 1850s gold rush. There was a highwayman working around here called Captain Melville, who was probably a violent savage, but he sort of cultivated the reputation as very genteel, a sort of Robin Hood-type character. For instance, on the 19th of December 1852, he held up two miners who were coming into Geelong, took 33 quid off them, and then gave them a tenner back so they could enjoy Christmas. But Melville's career was about to come to an inglorious end in what's now a tucked-away little corner of Geelong's CBD. Yeah, this is the exact place I'm looking for, McClarty Place, because a week later, on Christmas Day, Melville is in a brothel at the end of this street. Presumably the brothel was right down there, where it says, keep driveway clear at all times. And you can imagine he was sitting around with all the riff-raff celebrating his exploits, and predictably, very soon, they ran out of brandy, so they sent one of the women who worked there out to get some more. But she didn't. In fact, she went to the police and told them what was happening at the brothel, so they raced over there, burst in, and Captain Melville started firing at them, and he, he escaped through there, through that gate there, and ran off down Mallop Street, except, unfortunately... <laughs> I can't get this gate open, so I'll have to run around the other way. That's Mallop Street over there, so he came down this way, all guns blazing into Johnston Park, and ahead of him, he saw a horse. Excuse me, I hope you don't mind me doing this. And he tried to, he tried to mount it, but it, it, thank you, it bolted. So he was basically kind of stuck and then a local bystander brought him to the ground and the police surrounded him and that was basically it. He was captured and taken off. 
And there's actually a plaque to celebrate that event here in the park. It's not that extraordinary triangular thing there. That's for a local service organisation. It's not even for this, which is about the Belcher Fountain. It's not even, I have to say, about this La Trobe's Dam here. But right at the bottom there, it says, it was near this spot on the 25th of December, 1852, that the bush ranger, Captain Melville, was captured. That's a little recognition, isn't it? Walking around Geelong, I can't help but wonder what it would be like today if it had become the state capital all those years ago. Mind you, I think people in Melbourne would have done just about anything to make sure it didn't happen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could I prevail on you to do something for me? But before I do, I, are most of you from Geelong? Yes. Yes, we are. Um, 99%. What do you reckon that the attitude of Melbourne people is towards you guys? Well, they, they push us around. They, they think they're, they're so much more superior. They're just horribly jealous we've got the best football team <laughs> keep kicking their backside. Well, you know, in the 19th century, I think that was true as well. But I think the, the reason was really through insecurity, and I, I'll, I'll demonstrate that if I may. Could you draw a map for me? Have you got napkins over there? Could you draw for me Geelong, Ballarat and Melbourne, just the relationship between the three of them, a little map, yeah? All right, let, right, let's have a look, let's have a look. Yeah, you've all drawn them pretty equidistant, haven't you? You've got... There we are, Geelong, Ballarat, Melbourne. All this primary school map-making is because back then the Melbourne business classes felt threatened by Geelong's financial and commercial clout. With an unprecedented flood of visitors now flocking to the Victorian goldfields, they came up with a piece of cartographical chicanery to feather their own nests. And this is the map that they drew up in Melbourne. Can you see where Geelong is? Practically in Tasmania. Can you see that? It's ridiculous, isn't it? And, uh, as you can imagine, the, uh, the people in uh, Geelong were outraged by this, and there was uh, a politician called James Strawn, and he said, in this map, Ballarat is made to appear twice the distance from Geelong that it is from Melbourne, whereas the real distance of that township and its goldfields is only 48 miles in a straight line from Geelong, and by the same mode of measurement, 62 miles distant from Melbourne. In other words, uh, Melbourne is further away. Well, you wouldn't know that from that map. That is the kind of attitude that those people had uh, towards you then. And that is the kind of attitude that you perpetuate today. Never! <laughs> anyway, thanks ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. I'm coming to the end of my journey around Geelong, and I've uncovered two shocking secrets. You see, I'm not the only well-known person who's ever walked these streets, and I'm definitely not the fastest. In the year 2006, the final of the 50-kilometre race walking championships was held in Geelong, and the finishing line was right here on the waterfront. Uh, and it was won by a bloke from Geelong, which is why I've asked these people to uh, help me demonstrate that glorious moment. Could you do me a favour? Could you go right up by the carousel? Yes, and when sure. I say ready, steady, go, start timing. I will. Have you got that? Yes. You're all right with your yes. watch there? Yes. Um, it's all recorded on this plaque here. Nathan Deakson recorded three hours, 35 minutes and 47 seconds to break the previous world record. But above, it says, could you walk from here to the carousel, that's just down there, in 39 seconds? That's how fast you would have to go to keep up with world champion race walker, Nathan Deeks. Can we keep up with the world championship? Yeah. Do you reckon? Yeah. Yeah. On your marks. Get set, go! I always thought of race walking as a whole bunch of very fit people seeing who can not run the fastest. Oh, you're flagging! But I'm suddenly gaining a whole new respect for them. I think the dog's doing it easiest, don't you? We're trying to walk about 200 metres in 39 seconds and struggling. 
I can't imagine trying to do it continually for 50 k's, even with my well-honed technique. Yes! What? 55! 55 seconds! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not quite 39. But Not quite 39. Uh, oh, what can I say? Ooh. You guys were, you were rubbish. Oh. <laughs> and I was great, oh. the champion! Oh. Yay! Thank you! <laughs> Thanks, bye. <laughs> I reckon that walk around Geelong would take you a whole day. Unless, of course, you were Nathan Deeks. I've just about come to the end of my walk now. The sea baths are a couple of hundred metres down in that direction, so I've sort of come full circle. These two bollards represent the indigenous people, who, of course, were here for thousands of years before the Europeans arrived. I wonder what this little lad would have thought of present-day Geelong. Would he be amazed by its shopping malls and its football mania and its beautiful seafront? Would he still think of it as the place of the seabird over the white cliffs? Hi, I'm Tony Robinson. If you love my show and want to see some more amazing history stories, then please hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, and we'll let you know when there's something new to watch. Enjoy.